Good morning, Jersey Shore. It is short time with Vin and Dave, the place, the home, the morning. Where it is short time all the time. All Jersey Shore, Dave. Good morning. Good morning. You are fired up. Not that I you're know. ever not fired up, but you're ready for this morning. Let's do this. I'm ready to go. I'm rocking and rolling. You got the coffee going. I've had, already had going. two Again, cups. Again, we do have the coffee. I just do not see the food. I'm telling mm. you, you've been talking about I this. I know. I know. Show me... The food. Thank you. <laughs> One of these days, uh, I'll, I'll follow through. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, Keep on sure. me. Keep on me. Sure. All right. So we I'll send g- you some texts, uh, <laughs> reminders, notes or something. Oh, maybe a post-it. Then, reminder. Uh, how, bring- about, how about post-its? Some post mm. right on the post on your computer there, on the, <laughs> there by the microphone. I'm on it. <laughs> Bring in pancakes now. Um, we need David Burke for that. Oh, yeah. Hey, we'll have him back. We'll have a celebrity guest chef just make us food. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, guys. I'd love to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got a great show on deck this morning. A couple of great guests that we want to get to. We're excited about both guys have great stories. Phil O'Hara and John Roth will get to. But, Dave, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to somebody else we had on our show uh, about three weeks back, Jim Raffone, yes, CEO and founder of Jar of Hope. Of Tomorrow is the day where it is. he's heading out to, to climb Mount Everest. It's six days up the wow. mountain, six days can, can, back can down. Can I give you one of these? Or give him one of these. That's tremendous. So, so, first of all, great interview. Yeah. Oh, I, and the fact that's, I mean, wow. I, I, I have no words. It's I mean, a, think yeah. about doing this. So, think j- about the preparation, right. everything he's done to train, to get ready, physically and mentally to take this oh, on, yeah. and oh my, we wish him nothing but the best. Yeah, Jim, if you're out there listening right now, we're thinking of you. Yes, we're, we are. We're with you. Uh, so, well, we're not. We're, well, I mean, not, not yeah. in a physical sense, but you know, yeah, no, no, we're there I, in, with you in spirit. Yeah, so. absolutely. And yeah. you know what? It makes me think of a couple things. You know, number one, we're so proud of him oh, and yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. Um, I got. I have to ask you this. All right. Now that we're on this topic a little bit about just something tremendous that what he's doing. Um, the training and everything that went into it. Is there anything that you haven't done yet? Maybe bucket list type thing that you're like, I've got to do this. I just haven't had the time or whatever the circumstances to get you there. But is there something? That's a good question. I mean, I guess a sort of a life goal, bucket list kind of thing. Yeah. I want to visit all 30 major league ballparks. I like that a lot. I've always talked about doing it. Vin, let's get this done. <laughs> We're hitting the road. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I think it'd be really cool. I mean, the act of obviously, I've been to both Yankee stadiums in my life. You've been I to City, to- yes? Um, no. Ooh. It's not City or Shea. Wah, wah, wah. I've been to Citizens well, Bank it's gonna be Park tough to in go Philly. To, it's tough to go to Shea, but I'll um, get you to City. I've been to Fenway Park in Boston, but only for no, a I tour. I haven't okay. s- uh, seen a game there yet. Okay. But yeah, no, there's, I mean, you look at all these games played, uh, whoever's playing them. I mean, some of these stadiums in yeah. the country, they're just gorgeous. I went, I'm going to say it was 2016 to see um, the San Francisco Giants game out there. Oh, in San Fran? Ooh, beautiful. Oh, that's, gorgeous. that's one of the ballparks I really Absolutely want to go to. Absolutely gorgeous. And just everything about it was the location, the water's right M- McCovey there. McCovey Cove. Oh, it's <laughs> outstanding. The so, giant Coke bottle. I'm right with you. I, I think that is... So what you need to do, in my opinion, if you're going to go after this goal, All right. and this is something I didn't do properly, but whatever, I make mistakes. When I was out there, I should have done a better job of, okay, I'm in California what teams can I can I hit up that are oh, in California? Makes sense. You know yeah. what I mean? Now again, sure. it's not that they're these the other Dodgers, areas are close. Giants, Angels, right. Padres. It's not like it's close, yeah. but it's something where gas up the car and get it done. Yeah. Because Why how not? many times am I out that way? That, yeah, that's a good point. You know? So and I also thought the other thing too is I would love to do the same thing with football games. Yeah. Because think be... about that. So if let's say, you know, you went out and you wanted to Go to California. Again, maybe you get a, if you're lucky enough, you have the Sunday game, right? And then hopefully another team is playing the Monday game, you know, Monday night football. Makes sense, yeah. Or how great would this be? Actually, it wouldn't work because typically those games are going to be in the afternoon, the four o'clock game, one o'clock their time, just because of the well, time. It depends, zone. yeah. yeah but on it would the day be great the week. To, how great would it be to take in a one o'clock game there, mm-hmm. their, their one o'clock, right, but right. then have, if the Sunday night game, is in California as well. You, you see where I'm going with this. It's really kind of plot. <laughs> yeah, you everything could, you would have to plan be perfect. It out. Yeah. yeah, I mean you something know, like that would be very cool. So again, I talk Raymond about James it. Stadium in Tampa, uh, where the Buccaneers play. Yes. I think is one of those football stadiums that I'd love to see the big pirate ship and the cannons yep. and everything. That that's a fun stadium I'd like to visit. Another one would be Chicago. 
Oh, Soldier Field. Again, I yeah. would say go earlier in the year, not later in the year. Uh, the same thing with Lambeau See, Field oh, and Green, Green Bay. Uh, yeah, yeah, Green Bay. <laughs> it's funny. I have some uh, friends out in Green Bay, and they're like, oh, you got to come. I don't know why I haven't done it. But again, that's something you want to do the September game. You don't want the late yeah. December game. Where you're kind that's of a tough bundled up beyond exactly. belief and trying to get warm any I like way you where can. Your head's at. This Although is some good. people in I guess if you're used to that weather in Green Bay or Chicago, right. there are some people who got, you know, a painted chest, some of the guys out there. Uh, I'm like, yeah. dude. First of all, nobody wants to see me look the visual of that. <laughs> well, and that's then the of course, well, no, I'm just saying two things. The visual as well as how I would be feeling. That would be you have to mentally. I can't put yourself even imagine in some being in that a, kind of cold weather yeah. where it's Oh, oh wow. but I love the goals. That those are great yeah. goals. Those are great sports things. Goals. Uh, sports goals. You know, yeah. the, the bucket list. Go do them. <laughs> Why not? You know what I mean? That's it. Love we it. We got it. So we'll start planning now. Hey, okay. the weather's getting better. Yeah. Great show on deck this morning. We got Phil O'Hara for a peer recovery specialist with Hazlitt's Hope Network and a couple other groups. He's coming up first, and then in hour number two is the founder and president of the Ocean County Beast nonprofit Recalibrate, John Roth which helps active military men and women transition back to life here in New Jersey. So, great show on deck. We got lots of great conversations that we're excited to have this morning. So, Dave, get that extra cup of coffee and Already get yourself ready to go. I'm good. All right. All of you out there, get your coffee as well. We got great conversation. You're going to want to stay tuned in every minute of the show this morning. Must listen radio is right here. Absolutely. Every Sunday from 6 to 8 right here, 94.3 The Point, 105.7 The Hawk. More short time with Vin and Dave next. Hey, it's Chris Carlin from Rutgers Football and 98.7 ESPN in New York, and you're listening to Short Time with Vin and Dave on 94.3 The Point and 105.7 The Hawk. These fellas are entertaining. Whether you're in the early stages of investing, getting ready to retire, or planning your estate, you need a financial planner who will guide you on a clear path with honesty and transparency. Shoreline Wealth Management understands that you are more than your money, and they strive to help you realize your best life as they align your finances with your goals. Best of all, Shoreline's straightforward approach will include you in the process. Shoreline Wealth Management is your financial anchor. Visit ShorelineWealth.com for more information. ShorelineWealth.com. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SI. PC. Welcome back to Short Time with Vin and Dave. Vin Avenue, Dave Crossing with you. And joining us first this morning is a friend of the station and a friend of mine who joined me on a roundtable discussion last year, Phil O'Hara, a peer recovery specialist who does work with a number of organizations, including Hazlitt's Hope Network, a motivational speaker at the Les Brown Unlimited, a certified peer recovery specialist in Florida, motivational speaker, and working as the regional director of business development at Legacy Healing Center. So, Phil, welcome, welcome. to the station. Thanks for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. So, Phil's a great guy, so we wanted to have him in here. So, certainly appreciated your, your perspective um, on the, the drug addiction roundtable that you were on last year with, with Chief Whitkey and Haz with Alicia Cook and Terrence Turnbach. And um, certainly having Alicia on our show a couple weeks ago provided that perspective of, you know, watching a loved one go through um, an addiction uh, with her cousin Jessica. And Phil, you, you went through it yourself. Um, Phil ha- from Hazla went to Raritan High School um, and then found himself in the throngs of that that addiction to heroin and everything and phil certainly i want to let you author the story here uh but how how what what led into it you know certainly you know, we went to high school about the same time um but what what got you started was it a peer pressure kind of thing or was it something else that turned you on to heroin and, and other drugs so to give you the the quick run through highlight reel of of my story right um you know, I think a, a big problem we have when we educate young people on drugs and alcohol is, you know, uh, we tell them drugs and alcohol are bad and they're going to ruin their life, right? You guys have heard that before. Sure. Right. Uh, but what do we not tell them the first time that they drink? We don't tell them that they're going to experience fun that it's gonna physically feel good, that they could potentially have a good time. We only tell them drugs and alcohol are bad and they're gonna ruin their life. but. Uh, seventh grade, uh, New Year's Eve, uh, we snuck uh, a peppermint schnapps up to my friend's room. All the adults were drinking and having a good time, and uh, I had my first drink. Um, I drank some. I physically felt good. I drank a little bit more. I felt better. Uh, after about an hour, I got the courage to call the girl I had a crush on since the fifth grade. Turns out she had a crush back. I asked her to be my girlfriend. She said yes. Uh, I woke up the next day with a headache and a girlfriend. 
that didn't exactly ruin my life, right? That was sure. it was kind of an upgrade. Yeah. Falling in love? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was an upgrade. <laughs> right. We had a good time. Right. I could do without right. the headache, but, like, we had a good time. There you go. Instantly, everything they taught me about drugs and alcohol in school went right out the window with one night, right? Um, flash forward to high school. Uh, you know, I, I smoked pot for the first time. Again, wasn't a negative experience. Uh, and then my life really changed my sophomore year of high school. Um, I had to get my tooth pulled. It was wrestling season. Wrestling's a big part of my story. Um, I finessed my mom into pulling me out of school instead of having me as practice, right? Like, oh, I gotta take me out of school. So uh, my brother picked me up, took me to the dentist, took me to the pharmacy. I filled my prescription. I got a prescription of antibiotics and a prescription of opioid painkillers. Uh, it was 2002, 2003. There wasn't all this education about opioids. Right. Yeah. You know, mm. we, parents didn't really know what it was. My mom, I had these pills. They were painkillers. Sure. Um, I t went back to the locker room. I took two of them. The first thing I noticed is I physically felt good, right? I felt them enter my system. Um, and I'm not very flexible, right? So I get into the wrestling room and, you know, I can't really touch past my knees, but all of a sudden I go to stretch and my hands are touching the floor. Like I'm palming the floor and I was like, whoa. Wow. And now I'm not, you know, painkillers, pain. Obviously I, I know why I'm touching the floor. It wasn't a mystery as to why I was this flexible. Um, then we start wrestling and, um, I'm able to wrestle harder. I have like this sixth gear out of nowhere. Coach uh, blows the whistle to run sprints. I can't feel my legs. I can run as many sprints as you want. In fact, I'm winning every sprint. I have a physical allergy to opioids. So uh, a normal reaction is it's a downer, it's a depressant, it's supposed to make you tired. However, my body's physically different. When I take an opioid, I get energy, right? So I, fa I found this sixth gear. I walked out of that wrestling practice. I had one of the best wrestling practices I've ever had in my life. So you're wow. just seeing all positives here. All positives, okay. right? Yeah. And then flash forward to my senior year, uh, we wrestled Del Val in the state sectional finals. I have to bump up a weight class. I have a really tough match. I find my buddy who was uh, injured on the football field that year, had a laundry list of medications, gabapentin, Xanax, uh, opioids. Um, I went up to that friend. I asked him for a couple of pills. I had a big match. I got him. It was very easy to get. Uh, I took him in the locker room, and I went out and uh, won in overtime against a kid that was supposed to beat me. And uh, we won the first state sectional in Raritan High School history, and I did it high on painkillers. Who's going to tell me at 17 years old that drugs are bad? That's just not my experience. That's an interesting point because yeah. you're being told they're bad, but everything that you've experienced is complete has opposite. been a positive. And, oh, so wow. my wrestling okay. coach, Coach Nooch, who has been a constant in my life since high school, you know, after wrestling was the only thing that really kept me going, right? After wrestling season, my senior year, I, w I was barely showing up to school. You know what I mean? It just, I had no interest. I knew that I was going to get passed no matter what. They weren't failing me, you know? And um, and coach pulls me into the locker room like, hey, I heard you guys are drinking a lot. Hey, you're doing this. And it's like, Coach Newt's never drank in his life. That's a big part of his story is that he's not a drinker. Oh, wow. So I'm like, dude, you you don't even know. Like, you're telling me not to do something you're, that you have. He's right. talking, you but you're not no listening experience. at all to him. You have uh, no life experience right. in this. And, you know, so... Uh, I got to college. I fell out of college really quickly. I really just went there to wrestle, and, and I was out after two semesters. Um, I got into the Stone Setters Union, um, and that's when, you know, pill mills and doctor shopping was really big in 2006, 7, 8, 9. Oh, yeah. I got introduced to a guy that showed me how to doctor shop, um, and I found my way into the world of over prescriptions and you know unfortunately you know there was a, a large market for it and, you know, explain doctor shop so you could go to a doctor and tell them you're in pain and you can get a prescription and then you can go to another doctor and tell them that you're in pain and get another so prescription up and, and you were getting four or five prescriptions in a month yeah um, and there was no system linking anything so you know people were going to all these different doctors and getting all these pills and then just selling them on the streets and it got to a point where I didn't even need to go to the doctor I just had other people People that went to the doctors hmm. for me and you know I got involved in selling pills um, and again another thing that our society does is like glorifies you know criminal behavior in music in movies you know what I mean so oh, as a, 20, yeah, yeah, as a, a 23 year old kid with plenty of money like uh, I'm watching Sons of Anarchy like <laughs> they wrote this show about me you know what I mean and I'm really falling into this road that you know uh, not realizing how bad it is right and sure. um one, there's a Warren Buffett quote. You're a finance guy, right? There you go. There's a Warren Buffett <laughs> quote. Um, the chains that bind you are too light to feel until they're too heavy to break off of you. There you go. So, you know, the more you take them, you don't realize, you know, you're getting stuck until all of a sudden, boom, they figured out what doctor shopping was. They linked all the pharmacies. Right. They linked all this stuff. They made this federal mandate that now people went from getting five prescriptions to one. 
And now I went from getting all these pills to being able to get very little, and I felt what it was to be sick for the first time. And it, it was not good. Um, you know, I had very high tolerance. Um, I tried to stop on my own on the first time with a motorcycle, uh, and I did it. I, you know, I was a wrestler, right? I'm mentally tough. I had no idea about treatment or help. I just figured, like, you know, I could do this on my own. Right. I rode my motorcycle around Monmouth County for 11 days, withdrawing for 11 days, crying the whole time, uh, listening to the Eminem recovery album. Um, oh, wow. And I made it 45 days, and I thought I had this thing beat. Uh, my cousin overdosed and died. I went up to his funeral, and there was pills around, you know, environmental stuff. And I that typical, like, I'll do one. I did that. Right. I, mm, I right. tried it, and I relapsed. And when I relapsed, I made a decision that, like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm not a bad person, but I'm going to be a drug addict for the rest of my life. Like, you, I, that, that was your mindset? I, I okay. accepted the wow. fact that I was a drug addict, and I'm going to be the best drug addict there is. And, uh, and I went full blown into, into selling, selling drugs again. Um, and, uh, um, you know, my addiction progressed and progressed, uh, till finally I was in some legal trouble. Uh, that sent me to detox for the first time in 2014, not because I wanted to get better, but because I knew that I was getting followed by the cops. So I figured this was a good plan. I got out and relapsed again. Uh, I stopped selling drugs at that point. And from 2014 to 2016, when I didn't have the money from selling drugs and I couldn't afford pills anymore, uh, that's when I switched to heroin because uh, it was cheaper. And I snorted my first bag of heroin in 2014, and it felt exactly the same as that pill did in high school, hmm. right? And Interesting. now sure. that heroin buzzword that as a kid, you're like, this is bad news. Like heroin is like a guy right. in like an abandoned building. R right, right. Now right. it doesn't seem so bad. You know, it's it's just cheaper. It's a lot. It's more logical. That's an interesting point because I think people think of certain drugs and they put the face to it as this person, but yet you're talking about it and you're like, you know what? This is okay for me. It's cheaper and it works. It's working. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to your point, I mean, heroin. Uh, I think we brought up with Alicia Cook as as well. It used to be this more expensive thing inserted via the needle, but it's become so much cheaper within the last decade that it's become popular if you will on in different communities and yeah and 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 the opioid epidemic yeah. created a market where there wasn't markets you right. know what i mean like yeah. you would have to go into newark to go get stuff where now they've expanded to you could get stuff in any town in this county or in this state you know what i mean you yeah. don't have to drive to newark or jersey city to go get it anymore right um so it's become more available as well that's an interesting point that the other thing too is with drugs you're thinking you've got to go to these dangerous areas in, you know, yeah, in like ur urban areas or and whatever yet you're saying local here I've, it is I've you can get it so much stuff off unassuming housewives you know what hmm. i mean people that uh, husbands have a full-time job or they themselves have a full-time job but yeah like it's not the people that you think it is you know and 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 it's not not these vast criminal empires either it's just literally people that are leaning on each other to get by and not get sick and make just enough to get what they need you know um so i uh i ran for two more years um finally the drug stopped working it stopped having the effect. I take drugs because they take away my pain. So now your tolerance is so Is going high. so high that I'm not even getting high anymore. I'm just not sick. So I'd use drugs and I would just not be sick anymore. But like I wouldn't feel good. I was just miserable. Um, and then I was also a steroid user too. That was a big part of how I hid my addiction. I didn't look like what the ter stereotypical drug addict, all skinny. You know, I, I, I maintained a bigger weight. So I had these needles in my in my um, bathroom and I was sick and I didn't have enough money to get me through till payday and I had these three bags left and I made the decision to, to shoot heroin for the first time. And um, there was a man named Darren Rogers in Sunrise Detox in 2014 that said, son, you need to go get help. And I said, no, I need to stop selling drugs and hanging out with motorcycle clubs and hanging out in bars and I'll be okay. And uh, as I... I swear to God, as I started to send that needle towards my arm, I heard that guy's voice, you know, and I, I just remember him saying, kid, you need to go get help. And in my head, I was like, I'm, I'm going to go get help. Not today, but, but at some point, yeah, this right, is, right. we're, we're moving coming in the up. direction yeah. of yeah. help is coming, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, but not today. And I injected for the first time. I injected for about four months and uh, I lost my job. I lost the girl. Uh, my car got stolen in Kingsburg. I was living in Kingsburg at the time. Uh, I was so out of it 
that I would lose my car keys. So I just started leaving my keys in the ignition because oh it was boy. easier to oh not lose them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and some 15 year old kid, you know, was going through sure. cars and just took it for a joy ride and they didn't find it for three weeks. It was in Middletown somewhere, but I, uh, my car got stolen and I, I called out of work that day and I got fired uh, because I wasn't really the best employee, you know? So, uh, sure. So I took my layoff check and I bought the last amount of drugs I had and locked myself in a house for a couple of days. Finally, my mom called me and, you know, she said, uh, call the union and get on the list. And I was like, no, 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 no. She said, call your student loans and get on forbearance. I said, you're out of your mind. And I just leave me alone. And I hung up on her. And next thing I know, I hear her car pull up and my mom's this little four foot 11 woman. I hear her heels clip clopping up my, up my, my driveway. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And, uh, she comes in and she says, you're using again. And I said, yep. And she said, go get help. And I said, absolutely. And I think she was shocked. Right. Um, you're, doesn't this require an intervention, you know? Right, sure, yeah, right. yeah. I had experienced enough pain. I was so miserable at the end that I, I, I couldn't do drugs. They weren't working. I wanted something else. Uh, I made a phone call to a high school teammate, Richie Bryant, uh, who was uh, working for a treatment center. He got me scholarship into a facility in Florida. I went down there and, um, and I took the opportunity. However, my last night in Hazlitt, um, yeah. it got a little crazy. Um, I knew I was going to treatment, right? I did the assessments and I decided I was going to go. And instantly the first thing I felt was fear, right? What is my life going to be like without these drugs that I use to cope? Sure. And uh, I looked at my mom and I said, I need 60 bucks. And my mom said, why? Now, up until this point, you know, I didn't rob anybody except for my mother. You know, I didn't rob stores. I didn't rob people. But I would always finesse my mom into paying my cell phone bill that was already paid or my electric bill that was already paid. I could always get money out of my mom. And uh, she uh, she asked me why, and I couldn't even come up with a good lie. Hmm. I just said I need to get high. And uh, she, um, this is one of the worst moments of my addiction. She went to the ATM in tears and got me 60 bucks and was so afraid that that was going to be the bag that killed me, you know. But there was there was nothing. Like, I was going to go get it no matter what. Um, I start driving to Jersey City. Uh, I get pulled over by the Hazard Police, a uh, girl I went to high school with, uh, for a suspended license. Uh, I didn't have any drugs on me or anything like that. And I get arrested for a suspended license. Uh, they bring me into the police department. Uh, they let me go in a half hour on a summons. And I'm sick at this point. So my mom picks me up. She takes me back to the house. Says, promise me you're not going to drive. I said, scout's honor, not going to not going to drive. Uh, I ran into the house. I grabbed my girl's keys off the hook. I didn't even say hello to her, this poor girl that I had taken hostage. Uh, I just uh, took the keys off the hook, ran out of the house. My mom pulls away. I get in my, my girl's car, and I, I drive out of the neighborhood. And the insanity of this story is when I got to the light, my mom's at the light. There's a car there, and then I'm the car behind her. Oh, like wow. I couldn't even wow. wait for her to get out of the area. Hmm. And there was a bar across the street, and uh, I just threw a Hail Mary, like hoping that somebody was in there that had drugs. And I went in and the guy was there and, and it would just, it worked out, right? Um, and I, I get out of there and I'm going back to my house to use and I cross the double yellow line as I'm looking down and counting my bags to make sure I didn't get ripped off and I get lit up again by the Hazel Police. And it's another kid that I went to high school with and he's, Phil, dude, what are you doing? We just let you go. Oh boy. And uh, I just said, all right, dude, take me in. And um, I stuffed myself under the seat. And again, like I, 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 there was no reason to search my car, right? Like I just had a traffic violation right. and a suspended license. So luckily they didn't search. And um, he takes me to the police department. And now I'm there again for the second time in 45 minutes. And now it, this is the intervention that I had was, you know, three or four guys that I grew up with that are now cops coming into a room that all knew me as a good kid growing sure. up, just like, what is going on, bro? Like, you need to go get help. And I said, listen, I, I, I did the assessments. I'm going tomorrow. And, and I think 50%, they were happy. The other 50% didn't really believe that I was actually going to get on the plane. You know what I mean? And no, I, I, I went home. I, I got back to my car. I used that final uh, amount of heroin, and I actually overdosed. Um, I didn't get Narcan. Most people you know, see Narcanning as like an overdose. Right. Uh, I used my heart rate dropped enough that I fell out. I fell down on the bathroom floor. Wow. And I woke up like four hours later on the bathroom floor. Wow. Um, I didn't even know that was an overdose till I got to treatment. Hmm. And right. the therapist was like, you realize you overdosed and you could have died? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, no. If you wake up four hours later, that's because you overdosed. Um, so I overdosed on the bathroom floor. I woke up the next morning. 
my mom's friend, a uh, nice lady, Ethel, who's a very church goy lady, picked me up and uh, took me to the airport, and she was my angel. And I went to treatment. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's what started this road. Phil, Dave and I have to go to a break, but we want to dive into your, your journey into recovery What with what happened next. Can you hang with us? Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you, guys. Awesome. More short time with Vin, Dave, and Phil O'Hara right after this. Hi, this is High Performance Executive Coach Dana Cavalia and former Director of Strength and Conditioning for the New York Yankees, and you're listening to Shore Time with Vin and Dave on 94.3 The Point and 105.7 The Hawk. It's always great to hang with champions, and these two guys are champions. Whether you're in the early stages of investing, getting ready to retire, or planning your estate, you need a financial planner who will guide you on a clear path with honesty and transparency. Shoreline Wealth Management understands that you're more than your money, and they strive to help you realize your best life as they align your finances with your goals. Best of all, Shoreline's straightforward approach will include you in the process. Shoreline Wealth Management is your financial anchor committed to helping you weather life storms. Visit ShorelineWealth.com for more information today. ShorelineWealth.com. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member Fin. SIPC. Welcome back to Short Time with Vin and Dave. Vin Ebenu, Dave Crossan with you. And with us this morning is Phil O'Hara, a peer recovery specialist who took us in the first segment through his battle with addiction and closed out that first segment with him about to get on a plane to head to recovery. So, Phil, it was a, it was a very deep um, story. I mean, you kind of went through so much and went into great detail. So, when your your mom's friend Ethel drove you to the airport, what what were some of your feelings going on the plane, and how did everything work when you went to the facility and started rehab? Unfortunately, my, f- my first thought was, can I get Ethel to stop in Newark before we get to the airport? But that's uh, a tough ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's just such a good lady right. that I was right, like, well, right. I guess that was my right. last use. Um, what was that flight like? I gotta oh, think it I, must have taken. I mean, uh, uh, with everything uh, that you're going through. Unfortunately, and and um, I, I had some benzos that I had saved, so uh, so I took uh, I took some benzodiazepines before I got on a plane, and uh, I, I had two glasses of wine. I, I really don't even remember okay. the plane ride too much. I, I numbed my feelings out because I was just so scared, right? Sure. Um, and then uh, I remember the guy at the escalator that picked me up and he had a big smile uh, and he drove me, you know, from Fort Lauderdale Airport up to Port St. Lucie to uh, the program Amethyst that I had went to. And uh, that was a great, like, first impressions are everything, right? I was met by oh, yeah. a guy yeah. that genuinely cared, you know what I sure. mean? He liked his job. He was in recovery. He, he enjoyed picking people up and, and getting them well. Um, and I went into treatment and uh, my buddy Richie Bryant was there, which was so beneficial because I felt like such a freak at 28 years old going to treatment. Like I, like you feel like a circus animal, you know what I mean? Like being looked at, like judged, whatever, uh, you know? Sure. And, and when, yeah. when Richie showed up to work, it was my friend from high school. So I felt a little bit no, more normal when he was there, you know what I mean? Like I just, it, it helped me. Kind of like that, that familiar face. And the other part of this was like, I was really out of my mind, you know, the addiction damages the prefrontal cortex of the brain, you know, it completely shuts it down, which is the part of your brain that controls all rational thoughts. You're, you're running on survival instinct. So like, you're, I was a little crazy when I first got down there. Um, I was very angry. I had a lot of emotional pain. Um, I, I was very short tempered. So treatment was very difficult for me because there was those kids that didn't take it serious. And of course, I'm there to get better, right? right so like, right, I'm yeah. getting mad at the guys that are just not taking it. Like little things are just really hypersensitive about, you know? Sure. And, um, and in 45 days, I learned how to not be aggressive to handle my emotions. I cried a lot. You know what I mean? Like I did a lot of crying. And it, it wasn't bad. Like it, it, it felt good. Like I felt like a wet towel that was getting like wrung out. You know what I mean? And um and Makes I got sense. I got to some of the core stuff between my parents' divorce and like where it went wrong, like like stuff that I just kind of stuffed down, you know. And people they call treatment centers treatment centers. They need to call them separation centers because you're not going there to get cured. You're going there to get some separation from the streets and from the drugs and to get a bird's eye view of what's wrong in your life. Makes but sense. You don't walk out of treatment cured, right? You walk out of treatment a very very fragile person in early recovery that you know, the slightest thing could set you off. And I made it about 60 days. I was living in Port St. Lucie. I was going to meetings and uh, my aunt uh, died of an overdose in New Jersey. Mm. So I get a phone call from Coach Nooch at 8.30 in the morning on a Sunday and I knew somebody died. Um, I thought it was uh, Coach Donalds, our wrestling coach who was a little bit older. And I said, "What?" Uh, I said, who died? Was it Coach Donalds? And he said, no, it was Aunt Debbie. 
uh, my cousins were wrestling on the team for him at that point. So he was very tight with my family. And I was shocked, right? Um, sure, sure. And, you know, like my f- substance abuse is in my family. You know, it's, it's, it's a multi-generational thing. Uh, hopefully that this is a generation that it ends. But I, I, I was shocked. I got on a plane that night. I wasn't planning on going home. You know, I hadn't been planning on going home for a long time. And uh, I got on a plane to go home and I, I made it home. And I, as, as soon as I was home, I was uncomfortable, but I didn't realize what it was. Um, I made it about 48 hours uh, and I went to go see a friend and her roommate walked in and said, hey, I got my Adderall script. Ugh. And that's all it took mm. for that mental obsession to kick in my head. And I was like, ooh, Adderall. And I was like, let me get one. And they were like, you just got a rehab. I was like, I just got a rehab for heroin. Excuse me, this is Adderall, right. completely different, not the same. And they were like, yeah, no, dude. Uh, but that, that obsession to use popped in my head. And uh, I, I left after about 30 minutes when I realized they weren't giving me anything. And I, I drove to my buddy's house who I knew had heroin, who was still in active addiction. And I said, listen, let me get a bag. And he said, no. And this kid cares about me. You know, no, I'm, you're doing good. I'm not giving this to you. Un- you know, I think a big misconception is that, like, addicts don't care about one another, you know what I mean, or they just want to see it. That's right, not true. Right. You yeah. know, when yeah. my friend saw I was doing good, he really did not want me to go down the wrong path like he was still on. Yeah. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm either going to pay you for that bag or I'm going to fight you for that bag. So you're going to give it to me. And at that point, it was like, dude, whatever, here you go. And I went into the bathroom and, and uh, you know, I wasn't going to shoot it, right, because um, I didn't want to overdose and die. But I tore the bag open to snort it and I looked at it like, ah, I shouldn't do this. I don't want to do this. Like... I just went to rehab for this, but I did not have the power to say no. And and I just, I did it, you know, thinking that I knew it was going to be bad. The first day was great, right? The first day I used it physically felt good again, right? That feeling that, that I had lost when I went to treatment, it was there. And I was like, oh, I remember, you know? And then the second day wasn't as good as the first. And by the third and fourth day of using, I was completely miserable again. And I was like, what am I doing? So um, I got through the funeral. I got back down to Florida and I got back to to getting help and and getting a program, and that was June third, two thousand sixteen. And my life changed. Uh, I, I I'm grateful for that relapse because I really needed to understand how miserable I really was. And forty five, sixty days separated from the misery, and seeing how good I felt to going real quick, real fast into the misery again. It was like all right, that that switch. That was it. That's what you needed. Okay. And, uh, and, 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 you know, like I said, when I decided I was going to be the best drug addict I've ever been, you know what I mean? I I made a decision that I was going full tilt into this recovery thing. You know, my buddy Richie said, listen, stay down here, uh, stay sober. I'll get you a job in treatment, you know, and I, I did construction for a while until I had enough sober time to get working for the facility that, that got me sober. And I started in housing, which was a great job. I was working with you know, working on the sober livings, making sure people were sober. And, you know, at 28, I was a lot older than a lot of the kids that were going to treatment. They're 21, 22, 23. So I didn't have much recovery for them, but I had like a lot of life advice for them. You sure. know what I mean? Yeah. I, I got really addicted at like 23, you know, so I experienced some things. You know, a lot of these kids are coming in. They've been addicted since they were 16, 17. They have no life skills, no coping skills. So I really enjoyed that. They sent me for a recovery coach training. I love that. I was listening to a lot of motivational stuff, Les Brown. I found out he had a uh, motivational speaking institute, and I went there. And at that point, I was afraid to hear my voice on a microphone through speakers. I was afraid. Like, I couldn't do it. I would choke up on a mic. Oh, sure. And uh, they throw you up on stage. And, like, that institute was more about knocking the cobwebs out, about sure. just speaking in front of a room full of people. And I fell in love with it, like, instantly. Like, once I got past being afraid of it, I fell in love. And that's when I knew I wanted to go across. Like, I, like this is where I started setting goals, right? Like, sure, yeah. having goals is what saved my life. And one of the goals was I wanted to go back into high schools. I wanted to speak. Uh, we started at Raritan. Coach Nooch went live, and it, it went all over. And I got three more schools from that in the Bayshore area. I met this guy, Michael DeLeon, with Steered Straight, who goes across the country. He started sending me to Indiana, uh, Iowa, all these different places wow, to that's speak. great. It's awesome. Uh, my job sent me to, to the Arise Interventionist training with Judith Landau, and I got trained to be an interventionist. And it just kind of spurred into all these different things. And then, you know, Hazlitt Hope started, uh, which has kind of been the best thing that, I have been a part of uh, since finding recovery. So um, Chief Meehan and Chief Whitkey uh, in Hazlitt, they met with us. There was a need uh, for guys like me that were getting arrested multiple times with bail reform. You know, we're just arresting people, letting them go, arresting right, people, and letting right. them go. There was a program in Gloucester, Massachusetts that had 
people going into the police department upon arrest, people in recovery. Uh, we told them about that, and both the chiefs agreed that it was a good idea. And this kid that was a nuisance to Hazlitt for a very long time, a well-known nuisance, was now uh, allowed to go into the police department with other volunteers and hmm. start helping people. And uh, that's that's how Hazlitt Hope started. Uh, you know, upon arrest, we go into the department, we talk to people that need help, and see if they want it. And a lot of times people get arrested the first time and they're like, dude, get out of here. I don't have a problem. Right. And then they get arrested the right. second or third time and you're back and it's the same coach. It's like, hey, what happened two weeks ago when you said there wasn't a problem? Sure. And then that second and third contact is when we're able to move them towards the direction of recovery. And then uh, Keyport uh, and Hazlitt. I, what I love about working in these departments and, and from the civilian aspect, especially my criminal side of it is like, you have this perception of police and then you get inside the department and actually get to work with these guys. Number one, they're hysterical. All of them, they're great. <laughs> uh, but they, the interagency work in specifically Monmouth and Ocean Counties is really amazing. Right? Yeah. Um, these departments communicate with one, one, one another. So when the chief uh, in Keyport, uh, Mark Hafner and, and – now Chief uh, Shannon Torres heard that this was working. They allowed us into that department. Then it spurred to Keyport, Homedale, Kingsburg, Union Beach, Hazlitt, wow. and Red Bank. That's awesome. That call us for help uh, for people in the community. So that's been, uh, I think, the greatest thing that, that I have been a part of since finding recovery. Not only for the people that we've helped, but for the change in culture inside the departments. Uh, because this is the first generation of cop our age yeah, that yeah. have lost friends to addiction that were good kids, right? So sure. they know that this isn't like a a, a, a bad guy type thing. I, right. I think the older generation Before, cop, yeah. it was right. like good guys, bad guys, and these are bad guys, right? This newer generation, they really have a lot of empathy. They've lost family members, right? Yeah. right? And they want to help the people that they come across. And to see the shift in the department and see it trickle up to some of the older guys that when this first came in were kind of like, Eh, I don't know about this. Right. That are now like the number one guys to call that are our biggest huh. advocates. Like, hey, we got to call these guys. They can help you. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's like that has been awesome to be a part of. And and I think that needs to be said right now in, in a time where, you know, police don't really get a lot of good things said about them. Our county, specifically these two counties, the law enforcement has really, really shifted into trying to get these people help. Yeah, no, agreed. It, 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 uh, prosecutors in both counties, both excuse me, both sheriffs in, in Ocean and Monmouth County and in just law enforcement in general, just kind of dedicated to trying to get people on the right track. And, and to your point as well, it's, you know, the old school, maybe the old school is kind of thinking in society in general is like, if you're using drugs, you're a bad person. But I mean, Phil is just one of the examples That's a great of point. it's good people who become addicted and, and kind of and trapped, but you know, good people you go you go to talk to them and the, you can have a great conversation have some fun you know get to know the the inner person there and just great people who who are struggling with something and i think it's great that law enforcement at the jersey shore and beyond is is doing even more these days to to help people find recovery it's not a moral failing of the individual sure right? yeah. Um, yeah one of my coworkers, she i didn't know her in active addiction and she is like the sweetest, most polite, like well-dressed, <laughs> well-kept person. You know what I mean? Sure. And then, you know, we've worked together for a year now. And we stories after hours, you know, people start talking about the insanity of where our lives went. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of the stuff she told me, like, my jaw is on the floor because I'm like, I just can't see you doing any of that. You know what I mean? But the reality is that addiction will make you do some really crazy things. And, sure. And, you know, I'm sure there's some people that know her prior to getting sober that haven't seen her right. since what she sure. is now and still have in, in their heads that that person is a bad person. You know what I mean? But I didn't know that person. I know this person. You know what I mean? And I'm sure there's still people out there that I owe apologies to that you know, hear my voice and cringe on these radio stations. But the reality is, you know, who I am today is 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 not who I was. And I'm not ashamed of who I was either. You know, I, I really, like, people ask me, like, would you change anything? No, I truly believe that everything happened to me for a reason, that this was this my was your, purpose. Yeah, your journey. There I you am go. living in my purpose, and, and, and this was just laid out before me. You know what I mean? So it doesn't matter how bad the person gets. They can get better. Like I like I do a lot of intervention work, and I think a lot of family members get so angry with what the person's doing that they just give up. And like we can't help this person. We can't help this person. And it's their loved one. And listen, there's no helping them. You can help 
up until the point of them being in a coffin. Up until that, there's there's nothing you can't do. It, right? Never you too can late. continue to move the ball forward and try and help that individual until they, they're done yeah. breathing. You know, there's help out there for interventions. You know, I, I think a lot of a lot of people all right, for example, you do finances, right? Correct. Could I structure my four oh one K on my own as well as you could? Uh, no, I would hope not. Right? <laughs> I really have. No, I, don't, I actually I don't mean it that way. I, and, and, yeah. and one thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, part of what we do here with the show, I'd love to put out the educational piece so that somebody can, if they don't have assistance, can make good decisions. So I, I'd have, I'll be honest with you, right. I have no idea how to do it. Right. This guy comes in once a year, I sit with him, he opens up my ADP app right. and tells me what to do, and I'm just like, okay. Right. right? <laughs> and for some reason, when it comes to substance abuse and helping your family members, people with no experience right. like to tell everybody how to do it. But they have no idea. That's They've great, never you know done what? it. I'm glad you went that's that way. Right? That's a great point. So yeah. like, you wouldn't go build a house right. without a construction guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Makes You're sense. not going to be able to build the house, but right. for some reason this is one of those things where like people are like, "Oh no, we just got to we just got to do this. Or we just got to do that." You've never helped somebody Good point. get yeah. out of a basement using drugs and depression. Right. So why do you think you know how to do it? The best thing that you could do is just tag somebody in that knows how to do it and can help you. You know what I mean? And very often, it's got to be somebody outside the family. As an interventionist, the biggest mistake I've ever made was trying to help somebody who I loved and facilitate the intervention on my own because my ego told me that I could do it. And it went off the rails immediately. And you know, I, I, I should have brought somebody outside into the situation that was unbiased. There wasn't emotional ties there. You got to take somebody from the outside that is just not involved. And everybody's right. unique and everybody's different. So yeah. some people might be like, oh, it's just tough love. Go this direction. That's going to do it. Well, no, there's a lot going on with all of us. And obviously the direction you went, there were things that you found out. So you're dealing with somebody who was adopted, right? And their core emotional status from a child was I was abandoned. Mm. I was abandoned by my real mom. I was abandoned by this person, right? And then that person who's dealing with abandonment issues, mm-hmm. you're going to abandon? You're going to tough love to death? And Yeah, so, there you go. You yeah, know what I mean? You're, you, like each case is individual. You yeah. know what I mean? You There is no one size fits all. I hear that all the time working in treatment, but it's really, it, there's no one size fits all solution. You know what? You know, and, and then there's the other ones that are super entitled that if you don't start pulling back right. resources, I mean, unfortunately, they've taken control of the family, right? You walk into an environment where the, the, the child is running the show, yelling at mom, go make this, yelling at dad to go do this. And they're so in fear that their child's going to, that they're like taking orders. You know what I mean? That's a different situation where it's like, hey, listen, guess what you're going to do? You're going to turn the cell phone bill <laughs> off. You're going to do this. You're going to start pulling this people. And the, the person of concern is be like, what? And their whole world's going to go upside down. You know, that's a different that's a different case, sure. You know, than the kid that's adopted that just has real abandonment issues. That you're not gonna. You need to do the opposite. You need to surround him with love, right? To get him to realize that he's not alone. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. so individualized. It really is. And honestly, uh, I hate when I talk about interventions with such enthusiasm because I love the art of interventions so much because right. it's somebody that's struggling, right? But that being said, it's the closest thing I've ever had to winning a wrestling match in my life, right? I I, I go into a situation, you're nervous, you never know how it's gonna go, how the person's gonna react. I have about 45 seconds to make this person not hate me right off the jump, you know what I mean? And, and, And then eventually I'm able to get that person that hated me going through the door into getting help. And then not only that, but they're calling me, thanking me, Months later, and it's like, dude, thank you. Awesome. You did sure. it. You did it. Please stop giving me the credit. You made the decision to go get help. But these relationships form. You know what I mean? Some of the some of the closest people I have in my life are people that I've done interventions on because there's just there's a, a bond and a trust that builds. And you know, and you know, there's there's a handful of people that have been in my life two years, three years, and um, and it's because I did an intervention with them. Phil, as we as we wrap up here, just want to ask one more question of you, especially in today's kind of society, whether it's the consequences of New Jersey's bail reform laws that I know many in, in, in law enforcement sheriffs have, have been advocating for ch- that it needs to change because it's creating a revolving door in correctional facilities and, and, and just the, the availability of drugs. I mean, we talked about, you know, when we were in high school, what, what 
kind of drugs were out there. And now it's, you know, cheaper heroin that's out there. There's meth, crack, cocaine, and now most recently in New Jersey, recreational marijuana is, is now legal. So how complicated do you see things now for in, with either people being tempted to use any one of those drugs I just mentioned or, or, or others? And in trying to, for those who, who are going through it right now and trying to find recovery... So this is where we go down the road of, I don't want to use the word controversial, but what I will say is my views that I'm about to give are my own. They're not the views of Hazlitt Hope. They're not the views of Legacy Healing Center. They're not the views of Steer Street. These are my own views. Bail reform, while I understand bail reform, I get so many phone calls from parents that says, can I just like lock him up like he's got drugs on him? Sure. And, you know, no, unfortunately, he's going to get arrested and released and arrested and released and arrested and released right so um that separation you know and and this is again controversial there's clinicians i'll be like there's no uh you know clinical data that says that them going to jail for that week does anything right but i know enough personal stories uh, of people that dried out in the county jail and that's when they had their you know awakening that this was not for them right so we're not able to dry people out that you know should be getting arrested Right. Um, And then uh, so that's a problem. Right. Um, And then the other part of this is, you know, we're legalizing marijuana and everyone is so happy about this. Right. But the marijuana that we're legalizing right now is not the marijuana that I was smoking in high school in 2005. That was 10 to 12 percent pure THC. Right. We have commercialized marijuana. We have given it to to scientists, big pharma, big commercial marijuana companies, and they have genetically modified this marijuana uh, and they have taken it from 12 percent THC in the plant up to 45 percent in the plant. Right. So you can go into a shop now and go buy super potent marijuana, the plant, 35, 45 percent. But we've taken it a step further. We've shot butane and propane through this marijuana coming up with a concentrated THC oil. And this is where people are going to come from my head on social media when they read this because there's a lot of marijuana advocates that refuse to acknowledge what I'm about to say. We are seeing psychosis from young people and people of all different ages from smoking concentrated THC dab pens, right? I did not believe this the first time I heard it uh, until I went on an intervention and uh, the guy was talking about hearing voices and seeing demons. And, you know, I, I joke with my wife that, you know, I should take the civil service tam- exam and be a drug recognition expert. You know what I mean? Though, because sure. I know who's yeah. on what, right? right. Like I, I could walk in and my wife says, what's that guy on? And I could tell her. Um, and when I walked in to assess the situation, he told me what, what, was, what he was experiencing. And I said, you know, how much meth have you smoked and how many days you've been awake? And he was like, no, 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 I just smoked my, my, my weed pen. And I was like, all right, well, like LSD, mushrooms, some type of, no, 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 just my weed pen. We took him to carrier clinic. We got the drug test results. It was only THC. Since then, I've done five interventions on people that were in psychosis, in manic states, from concentrated THC oils. The one kid thought uh, the buttons on his shirt were cameras that his parents had placed on there, that there was microphones in his room. You know, and when you're dealing with mental health, you know, it's it's a different type of intervention. Right. You know, and right. I had said, you know, if I could take you somewhere that made the cameras go away, would you go? And he said, yeah, right now. And, you know, we got him into a mental health facility. But they, it was just THC. And then the problem is a lot of treatment centers, insurance companies will not authorize treatment for marijuana. They will not it's, authorize yeah, it. It, makes, it, it, yeah. it, it, it. But, you know, you have to get them into a mental health facility. And in this state, there's not a lot of mental health facilities that aren't hospital based or you know what I mean like there's levels of mental health there's right, people in right. there that are having auditory hallucinations that you know want to stab yeah. people and then there's people that are you know manic and and but they're all kind of together right so there's a huge need for sure. for mental health right now absolutely uh, vaping in our middle schools and high schools has tremendously skyrocketed and that's the most addictive substance we have right so we're hooking kids at 13 14 on nicotine at the rate of like 40 percent middle schools and 70 to 90 percent in high schools it's crazy right and it's yeah. a progressive disease so what is that kid going to be addicted to at 23 at 33 right we're priming their brains for addiction now with marijuana with alcohol with thc and then um methamphetamine is going to explode in this state 
right? So uh, people are dying from fentanyl. We've done a great job of educating kids that fentanyl is killing people. So kids aren't using fentanyl or they're not using heroin, but they, we haven't addressed the underlying causes and conditions as to why they need to escape in the first place. And they're moving to benzos, they're moving to alcohol, they're moving to Adderall. And then Adderall is leaving this huge void, just like opiates did for methamphetamine. And now we are seeing in the state of New Jersey, which we never saw, methamphetamine was like a Tennessee thing. We're seeing methamphetamine explode on Long Island, explode in New York, and it's going to get worse. And when that meth bomb goes off, it's going to make the opiate epidemic look like a joke, right? Because people, not as many people are going to be dying, but there's going to be a lot of people that are just out of their minds doing crazy things. So we're not, I hate to say this, we're not going in the right direction right now. You know, COVID didn't yeah. help. Lockdowns didn't help. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, social media doesn't help. Facebook does not help. You know, it's a great tool when used properly, but it's, it's, it's a distraction advice and it's all negative. The algorithms just feed us negative stuff. So we're just kind of slowly disconnecting and disconnecting and disconnecting. I mean, people that families are, are, are fighting over politics and not talking to each other. You right. know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and, and addiction, the yeah. solution to addiction is not sobriety, it's connection connecting with other human beings and we are we are slowly becoming more of an isolated society which is why the numbers are continuing to go up phil one last uh, bonus question here real quick the bonus, to, round. To, to, yeah, the bonus round as we close up on, on a lighter note so obviously you mentioned your wife so recent marriage congrats and you're you. uh, a new father as well so what's that been like congrats She's fantastic june 19th uh we are expecting uh our baby girl and uh it's something i never thought i'd be able to experience i always wanted a kid Sure. But I, yeah. I always knew how much I was dependent on my mom. You know what I mean? So like, thank God I didn't think a kid would fix me. Like I, I knew I wasn't in a position to have a kid. And then uh, I got sober and I reconnected with my wife who I had met in college. So that short time that I was there, she stayed, I didn't, right? You know, I found my partner and, and we, you know, had the fairy tale wedding that I never thought I'd be able to have. And, you know, we didn't wait too long. And, you know, now we're going to be having a baby about six days before our first wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. That's great. And, uh, <laughs> That's awesome, dude. And it's a baby girl and I'm super stoked. There you I'm go. glad I got a girl. You know, I'm going to be a girl dad. So I'm, <laughs> I'm really... Uh, yeah, I just never, I never thought this would be a thing, and it is, you know. Phil, appreciate you, you sharing your whole journey, uh, your battle through addiction, recovery, and, and kind of g- offering some perspective on where things are at now. So with with all the organizations that you're with, including Hazlitt's Hope Network, please continue to do what you're doing because you're affecting real and direct change everywhere. Thank you. And I, uh, I just want to say, uh, if you're listening to this and, and, you know, you have a loved one that's struggling, and um, we do have a crisis line for Hazlitt Hope. It's a recorded line. Uh, it's 100% confident confidential. Uh, you could reach out and, and talk to a recovery coach that could help deploy out and facilitate an intervention for your family. Or if it's just you that's struggling, uh, the phone number is 732-739-7717. And uh, that's available 24-7 to anybody in New Jersey. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for so adding much. that in as yeah, well. So uh, do whatever we can to help people find recovery and encourage others to do the same as well. So Phil, appreciate you, you uh, as always, coming on here and talking about everything. We really appreciate it. And you're welcome back here anytime. Thank you, guys. It's a huge you. honor. And I had a lot of fun. So, you know, if you want to call me back for stuff that's not addiction related, I'll still come back. You know? <laughs> sounds like, sounds like <laughs> a Phil plan. O'Hara here anytime. <laughs> More short time with Vin and Dave next as we head into hour number two. Hello, this is Chef David Burke on short time with Vin and Dave on 94.3 The Point and 105.7 The Hawk. And if you could see us, you'd know the three of us have perfect faces for radio. Whether you're in the early stages of investing, getting ready to retire, or planning your estate, you need a financial planner who will guide you on a clear path with honesty and transparency. Shoreline Wealth Management provides clarity through the complexity with offices in Manchester and Manahawkin. Shoreline Wealth Management is your financial anchor. Visit ShorelineWealth.com for more information and start your financial journey with comfort and security today. ShorelineWealth.com. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC.